So I would uh, like to thank uh, Christine for coming in here with us in Skopje for the Macedonian pr premiere of Shooting Ourselves. Um, so um, this is the inauguration of this segment of the program that we call PFF Doc, our uh, Philosophical Film Festival documentary. So this year we have one documentary that we are displaying and this is Shooting Ourselves from Christine Sin. Uh, probably you have watched The Act of Killing, maybe some of you. She has been co-directing that film. And I think that there are some interesting threads that I would like to link at the beginning of our talk um, and uh, just try to explore a bit further. Uh, with Christine, we've met on an international conference about film and philosophy last year in, in Germany. And I'm extremely glad that uh, she responded to, to our offer for her to come here and that we are sitting together now having the masterclass yesterday and tonight um, watching, shooting ourselves together. So um, the first question that I would like to pose Christine is um, you have sat in one place there are times when one chooses to make a film and there are other times that, that the film chooses you. So the question would be, how did Shooting Ourselves choose you and who are Rimini Protocol actually? How did you meet and how did this project come out? Um, <clears throat> so yes, uh, th this is something that I said um, previously about this film. It was. It was a film that happened to me, in a way, that I happened to meet the director, one of the directors of Rimini Protocol, after a screening of The Act of Killing. And we went to lunch, and he started to tell me about this project that he was doing. We were in Berlin at the Berlinale, and he said, uh, you should come onto the set, we're building this set. And I was trying to understand the project, and it was a little complicated. And so I went to the, I went to the set, I met one of the protagonists, the man who's the Armani of yeah. um, bulletproof wear. And I started to understand um, how incredibly strange this project was, and especially how, um, how basically all of these people should never be together in one place. It's uh, completely unnatural. Uh, they, they really have no business together in the natural order of the world. Mm -hmm. That uh, child soldier uh, with the German head of protocol of the army with an Israeli sniper. It's just it was, it was totally uh, crazy. And I also realized that because of that, there was no rules for how anyone should behave. And I, I feel uh, as a filmmaker, whenever there's no rules and you have no idea how people are going to behave. It's a really good place to show up with a camera. So in this way, I just made a very quick decision and I said, well, I think you should document it. Mm. And he said, oh, but we have 50 people running around the set, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, no, I I'd like to document it. And in this way, they've then generously, so Rimini Protocol is this theater company in Germany. They do documentary theater and they work in a lot of different formats. So they do a lot of audience participation, and um, and they were very generous and invited uh, me on because I think they saw that there was an intersection between the kinds of uh, ways in which we used performance in a documentary way and what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Except for me, like um, what they wanted from their uh, from their protagonists. Uh, was a performance in which the audience could the audience could play the role of each of the characters. And so it was scripted and rehearsed and performed and all the audience would ever see. And here is uh, this small screen and the, the voice. But um, is it done with virtual reality or how how is the actual set the situation rooms looking like so our audience knows what is the actual project because this is documenting this this project of Rumini protocol so this this set the, the entire film is filmed on a set mm -hmm. and this is uh, the same set that the theater audience will go into but the theater audience will not uh, meet anybody they will only see other audience members uh, with these tablets and what do you have to do it's I would call it mixed reality, in which the tablet is, sh the, the image on the small screen is showing you, it was filmed in exactly the same room, in exactly the same place. And you have to, you have to match 
-hmm. what's on your screen with the place where you are. And you imagine when she says, pick up the tea, um, uh, shake this person's hand, you're supposed to do it. But the person you see on your screen and the person who is actually there are different. Um, the other person whose hand you actually shake is another audience member. Mm -hmm. And it could be you in 20 or 30 minutes. Um, but on your screen, you see perhaps the real person whose real story it was. And so, but what I'm interested in is it, in the intersection between um, reality and the performance of reality. Um, this actually has no fiction inside of it, but it has this performance mm -hmm. and this idea that um, another person could play you in a way. And, uh, but for me, then I needed to be with the actual persons and I needed to speak with them in, uh, uh, with another lens, with my lens. Mm -hmm. So we get them doing the performance with the directors and uh, we get them uh, talking to me one on one. And we also get them talking to one another, which I thought was How was really that experience? I, I was really interested to ask you. There are so many protagonists in here. You don't have one or two or three characters that you're following their points of view, but there are these intersections, these characters that are m mixing and inter uh, interwinding their opinions and communicating with each other. And all of them are actually equal to you. You shoot at them, but they also can shoot back at yeah. you and between each other. So there are as many people that are on the set, there are as many cameras. How was that feeling working with that many protagonists? As the, the character at the end, uh, the, the pilot driver, he's saying, I think that this will be really hard. How will she put these 20 <laughs> stories or these 20 different people together? How did that work out? This was really strange with everyone with the cameras because I've never filmed in a place where everybody had a camera. So we had uh, two cameras and the sound. Uh, Valentin, is, who's here, was uh, taking the sound. But uh, it, it was crazy because everybody's filming. And uh, it, it, it makes you, uh, you self-aware in a different way. And it also makes you realize that, ah, what do all these 20 different um, documents or artifacts of this moment, um, we are all filming the same moment, but they could all be completely different. They could be used in a completely different way. And at the same time, when we were all, for instance, sitting and eating together or having coffee or something, um, people are more or less the same. <laughs> and it, it's really confusing because actually a lot of people disagreed and a lot of people totally different investment and um, they, they, they were extremely different at the same time that the basic rules of how to be a human being when you are in a situation in a basic social situation were based they were compatible mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and even though the film I think is uh, dealing with a heavy subject I I felt some optimism from this optimism because the people actually uh, came and volunteered to put their story there and also because when they were together um, they were able to disagree in a way that was actually um, still respecting each other as persons and and in this way I felt it was um, it was a kind of relief to some of the experiences that we hear about. It's not the same, it's not like it, it negates it, mm -hmm. but I think that it creates some kind of understanding that, that um, mm, if we create a new situation for engagement, that the situation can also change uh, um, the dynamic that 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 we are all capable i think we are all capable of killing unfortunately i think that's true but i think that um it has to do with the framework that we're in and um because in a theater or set it's very typical for people to feel like a family um when you perform together 
um, you feel like a family. And uh, for me, this was very, um, this was a really positive thing that you could take people who were in, in many ways naturally opposed uh, coming from very different political points or very different national uh, perspectives and, and they were actually able to um, to be together and, and, and want to be together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now uh, I I would like to just go a bit into the the, the method of filmmaking or the, the way how you approach this film. I think that that was seen also in the act of killing, which you are co-directing co-directing co with Joshua Oppenheimer. Is that in a way you use the camera as a mirror, mirroring ourselves, but also mirroring the other. In this case, we're shooting ourselves. I shoot you. You shoot me. And with this um, ambiguousness of the term, actually, it goes both ways. And um, on one place you are saying, uh, can we see ourselves better through these small screens? So my question would be, um, can, I, can actually documentary filmmaking, because you are a documentary filmmaker, um, not just document reality, but instead create reality, transform it by invite, inviting those who are the protagonists uh, in your films to also um, participate in it. Also the spectators, we are going to talk a bit after about your future project. But um, this, this, this idea of the camera is a mirror that helps us see ourselves better or see the other better while rewatching our own acts, our own words. Um, how, how can you explain this idea of reflex, reflective looping? We have been talking a bit about it. Um, so in the context of your style of filmmaking. I think if, um, if you look at the history of documentary, there's different, um, th there's been, like, for instance, if you look at there's a, a school of documentary from the United States called Direct Cinema. And this is like um, um, Ricky Leacock or Fred Wiseman, people who observe like a fly on the wall. You hear the fly on the wall documentary. Um, but then um, it's, there's also Cinema Verité, which was, mm -hmm. came from France and uh, led in many ways by Jean Ruche. And this idea is, um, in, in direct cinema, the idea was that the observer should feel like they are directly there and that there's no one intervening between them and, and the, the scene that's happening. And um, in Jean Rouge, there was always, uh, you were aware that there was the film crew there and that they were making a film, that in some ways the things that happened in front of the camera were a performance from the camera. And anyone who has held a camera or been in front of a camera knows that nothing is the same when there's a camera uh, filming. Um, it, 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 it changes the things that happen. It's suddenly like um, the, everything becomes a performance in a very self-conscious way. And I, I think that um, Many documentary filmmakers will try to hide this. Many fiction filmmakers will try to hide this. There's a way in which you could say all fiction is documentary, right? Um, because you are actually filming people doing a performance. And it's not that the audience doesn't know that they are performing. Everybody knows. And there's this suspension of disbelief. Um, but when we talk about uh, the camera, what we realized uh, over many years before making the act of killing was that you could actually use the camera to provoke something in front of the camera. That uh, this change or the shift in reality when uh, someone knows that they're being filmed is actually, it's a special kind of reality. And in this special kind of reality, um, special things can happen. And if you work with that, it's like, um, there's a, a really wonderful documentary photographer named Diane Arbus. I don't know if you know her work, but she talked about the gap between, she said she photographed in the gap between um, what people think other people see when they look at them and what other people actually see when they look at them. <laughs> And it's this question of the posture, of the performance, of I, I'm performing myself, and the fact that that's not actually what people generally see. 
And in there is a contrast. And I, I think that in the end, though, what we started to do was uh, create a loop in which we could start to understand, like, well, what do you think I'm seeing when I look at you? Or what would you like me to see when I look at you? And then uh, typically uh, you film and then maybe show them the footage again. I mean, they watch themselves. And then what happens is they, they start to use the space in a different way. Uh, they use the space in the way that somebody would use a mirror. And they, they project themselves onto an anonymous audience or onto the film crew or so on. And I, I, in the end, I think that this can, um, it becomes a feedback cycle where um, certain phenomenon can start to come to the surface that uh, is, isn't obvious, for instance, in a conventional technique. And I, I think it's, it's only when you start to allow people to imagine themselves uh, in front of a camera and um, you reach a point of the, of the reflexive or looping performance where um, yeah, they start to question themselves in front of the camera or they start, it starts to have an effect on them. And, um, and, and this, I think, is, is something really interesting and different. I mean, I would say that in what Rimini Protocol did in, in uh, situation rooms um, was more about uh, me performing myself next to another person who performs themselves. And what does it mean for us to all be together in this situation. So the child soldier is there next to the doctor who has been treating victims of child soldiers. Or, um, you know, the, the, the man who has been selling uh, weapons. Um, you're not, he's not selling the weapons, but he's there uh, when the German army is selling to, to the Chilean army. And uh, what does it mean for him to be there, you know, uh, next to, um, next to a Syrian refugee? Or it, it, it's, um, these performances, uh, it, it forces them to see themselves, I think, uh, in the way that the audience might start to see them. And then it creates a loop, you know, for them. I think what was challenging about this film was that um, we had a very short period where they were together. I mean, they were really only together for five or six days. So we were filming like crazy <laughs> on these days to try and, and catch them um, there. And um, we made a decision that we would not follow them home to their home countries and, uh, and so on. But um, some of them I'm still in touch with. So I think that um, I wouldn't be surprised. or It would be really interesting if you've seen uh, Jean Rouche's uh, what is it? Chronicle of a Summer. Have you seen? Has anyone seen this film? It's Chronicle of a Summer, where they get to all these different people in Paris. They film them for a summer, and the last scene is uh, the people in the film watching themselves in the film. So they've edited the film, and they actually sit in the audience and watch it. And the last scene is them discussing the film after they've watched it. And I, in a way, I think if we had the budget, it would be really great to get this group of people back together and to watch the film and actually sit and... <laughs> That's something similar like you did and in the act of killing, you know, although it was a scene by scene, the way how you were shooting, you were presenting yes. them the scene and then keeping on like with the next scene, no? That would have been, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the so same it's, it's, it's this idea that, that things... Uh, Yes, when you see yourself or when you, uh, when you start to get certain degrees of separation, a camera can, can create for you a separation from yourself. And you can also see yourself as part uh, of um, part of society or part, in this case, what I, what I would call the war machine. And you see where you are in it. And I think for some people, like the, the man in the factory in Switzerland, I think... Um, he wasn't particularly a reflective man, but I think somehow being in the theater project, um, he started to think a little bit more uh, about the fact that um, even though he had no aggression against anybody, 
that um, that perhaps there was some kind of ethical question behind what he was doing. And, um, and that may seem like a very small movement, but I, I actually think that um, it's actually very difficult to achieve this kind of uh, change in your consciousness. When you start to question yourself, I think it's already the beginning of a change. At this point, I would like maybe to invite the public mm. so that we open the floor for, for questions. Uh, they can be in English, или можете да поставите прашање на македонски, па ќе ги преведеме на Кристин. Um, би сакала во овој момент да, да влеземе во, во заедничка дискусија. Um, дали има некој прашање од публиката или коментар, идеја од филмот, некоја импресија да сподели со нас? Oh, okay. Uh, uh... Hi. Uh, Hi. I, I enjoyed the documentary. It was really well made, and I liked like the stories interchanging one to another. It had a nice, uh, uh, let's uh, a nice flow of still different perspective. But uh, okay, I'm sorry. No, I'm not just talking in front of a camera. It, it was uh, quite pleasant. Uh, I want to uh, I want to hear maybe your thoughts. Uh, the former child soldier said really well uh, that weapons are the strength of the weak. Mm. So uh, are weapons, or generally uh, <laughs> the war industry or whatnot, is it a result of uh, weak people <coughs> who seek strength in order to impose their own perspective of how the world should be? Or is the war machine uh, causing uh, weak people out of let's say, because I think everyone would be destroyed if their relative was killed or if uh, something happened to their hometown and whatnot. And is, uh, are, the, uh, are the weak people who are, as a collateral damage, I'll use that term, uh, from the war machine, fueling the war machine into uh, expanding its own existence? I mean, uh, my, my question, I guess, kind of say is, are weapons really the problem? Or are the weak people who might be uh, the result of the usage of force, not just weapon, force cannot be maybe in the form of uh, weapons, uh, the weak people who seek out to uh, fulfill their ideas of how the world should be, fueling the war industry, which is still active, and nowadays we hear about, let's say, the Saudi airstrike in Yemen. Uh, is it just a cycle that repeats itself? Like? Weak people who need weapons, and then weapons killing, uh, forming more weak people who need more weapons in order to achieve their reality. How do how do we stop the cycle? Uh, it's one thing being self-conscious, but at the other time, uh, it, uh, this is just my personal opinion. Yeah, um, the, but but I believe actually that that uh, the question is not necessarily weakness, but it's a question of um, of what do we value. And uh, for many people, um, weapons are just like, um, it's like soap or like anything. They could buy and sell weapons and it's a good business for them and they think it's legitimate. And if they're not the ones who pull the trigger themselves, uh, they don't see any difference between uh, a vacuum cleaner and, uh, and an AK-47. And I, I think that... Um, it used to, there was a, an early part of the film where uh, they talk, they had given the Nobel Peace Prize to the EU. And it was really interesting because uh, many of the top 10 ex, uh, arms exporting countries, at least six of them, I think, six or seven of them are from the EU. And the European Union is having a crisis of values at the moment, where I think that um, the original union was actually an economic union. The, the, the steel and coal union, I think. And, um, and there's a great irony that the economic union that brought peace uh, to the former conflicting parties in Europe exported death to many other parts of the world. Um, and I, I think that um, it's, a, it's also a great tragedy that no one believes that the export, for instance, of these weapons and so on, um, 
um, means that anybody is responsible for looking after the people who are actually the victims uh, of the conflicts, most of whom have nothing to do whatsoever with the politics that made the conflicts. Uh, I think, um, and so it's, it's a question of, um, it's a very strong statement that he says uh, that uh, weapons are actually the strength of the weak. And in many ways, I felt he was one of the most mature or wise persons on the whole project, which was saying a lot, given the fact that he's in his uh, early 20s and uh, all of the things that he'd been through. And I, I think that um, it's a... I think that there is a, a sense in which uh, a conscientious decision needs to be made that the real um, the real thing that needs to be um, in which we need union on is uh, cannot mainly be the economy because the economy <coughs> doesn't have um, Essentially, it doesn't value human life in the same uh, in the same way, and, and and the weapons industry is the is the most obvious way uh, to look at it. And you know, at the end of the Cold War, the AK forty seven, um, which was mass produced, and and there were stockpiles and stockpiles all over Eastern Europe and the for, former Soviet Union, and these were sold. Um, much of them were sold to Africa. Uh, and to the Middle East, and um, although we have drones and various other weapons that are nuclear weapons that are much more dangerous in their capacity, uh, the deadliest weapons in the world are actually these uh, small arms. Um, and I, I think, in many ways, the way that these were traded were actually it was a purely economic uh, thing. There was some politics as well, like you know, political union, and so on. And I think that this connection between um, it's, uh, but it is really interesting. I mean, they the um, the way in which um, these weapons, when they start to flow into a country, and uh, uh, something that was maybe just a kind of tension between uh, different factions fighting for power can suddenly erupt into a full-blown uh, civil war or a war between different countries. Um, I think that that this question of, uh, of the weakness that actually emerges from that is really clear. And the Democratic Republic of Congo has been going through a number of civil wars. It's 17 years now. And they're still using child soldiers. And we still use, uh, it's not in the film, but I know this, but like almost every single mobile phone has like uh, medals that come from Congo. And um, it, it's, um, it's, it's difficult because we, we are connected in these sort of invisible ways. At the same time, they're not secret. It, it's known. Uh, people think that the arms trade is actually somehow some kind of very shady thing with gangsters and so on. Of course, that exists. But uh, the main arms dealers are actually governments. And most of it is uh, completely open. So I think that this question, um, you know, the journalist also talks about um, the people who actually fight in the field and the people whose homes are destroyed and who end up running and who are, you know, um, these are generally the weakest people in the society. Uh, and it's, um, yes, it's, it, it is a real, uh, it's a good question about how, mm -hmm. how, we, how we stop the cycle. But I, I think that the, the, the bigger decision is actually, are we going to unify on principles and values um, and, you know, and, and, and make that a priority essentially over economy? Because I, I think that ultimately, um, you know, Japan is starting to rearm again after many, many years. 
And I think that uh, it's, it's partly an economic question for them. And I think that it's, um, you know, they talk about China also. I, I mean, I, 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 it's hard for me to know whether these things are true, but there's a lot of rumors going on now because China is having a harder time to keep its domestic population under government control, that the best way to do that is to start a low-level conflict outside the country. Because as soon as they start engaging in some military conflict, it actually creates a much clearer way to have authoritarian control inside of your own country. And these are things that uh, when you... Um, you cannot separate, I think, the, the, the problems of, of weapons and, and, uh, and armed warfare and, uh, and this question of um, economy. Um, at the same time that the majority of people, I would say, um, definitely, um, they will lose. Um, and, and, yeah. Yeah, I will stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we, we give the space to someone else. Madruga Prasenio Publica. Good evening to everybody. Good evening, Christine. Good evening. First of all, I want to congratulate for this uh, great documentary because I believe that uh, keeping together 20 different people coming from many parts of the world and trying to get the best out of them and their thoughts intimate it's an intimate work uh, it takes uh, patient courage it takes many things so first of all <laughs> thank you for making this great uh, for me it's also a work of art but there is also a political meaning behind all this my question is first do you believe that uh, there can be another kind of world if uh, the actually the political and economic uh, system in which we are all of us doesn't change and second i would like to know what really inspired you and how it started this uh, uh, um, how you started to be so interested in those kind of topics thank you well thank you for your for your comments and um the first question is is do i believe that it's possible for change if we don't change the the, the p political and economic uh, trend that we're going on. I mean, I, I think that it, it, it has to be a, a big change. I, I believe that anything is possible. We were actually talking about this today. Um, do I think that it's likely? This I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm not particularly optimistic. I think for those people who can actually see, then we have nothing else to do but to actually try uh, to create something different. Um, uh, we have absolutely nothing to lose. <laughs> and, uh, but I think it will be difficult. And I, I think that even if we manage to change, it may not be in our lifetimes. And, and we, will see, um, we will see a lot of conflict. I, I see that now. I feel it. I think everybody feels it at the moment that uh, there's so much uh, electricity in the air at the moment. And, um, and people don't talk about it, but or they don't talk much. But, you know, nuclear disarmament has essentially broken down uh, between Russia and the United States. And this is very dangerous. Um, it's uh, and the direction with a lot of right-wing populist uh, groups rising in Europe. I think this is um, yeah we're 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 seeing we're in a, we're in a time of real change and a, a time when we we um, we will have to stand up. It's there's no choice with that. And why I made this film? I mean, I I I made this film because. I, I feel that um, it was this impossible situation where all these people were going to come together. And I, the first thing I felt was I didn't know what kind of film it would be. And I just said, but, but somebody has to be there. Uh, I, I just want to meet these people. I just want to see what happens when they meet each other. And uh, 
it it was a it was just an instinct really uh, to be there, and I was very. Um, it was an amazing. It was like a privilege to be there because I think the people really surprised me. I mean, I have to say, when the Israeli soldier started talking, I had no idea what was going to come out of this man's mouth. He looked to me 18 years old still, and I just. But at the same time, for me, when I think IDF sniper, it's hard for me um, to understand uh, what that would feel like and uh, what that's like. And um, you know, he. He, he really surprised me. Uh, it's not in the film, but I asked him, I said, uh, if you just had carte blanche and you could, he said he wants to be a theater director. I said, if you could just uh, make any play that you wanted to, um, what would you make? And he said, I want to do a stage version of Battle of Algiers in Israel. And I was like, <laughs> he's like, you know the film? I was like, yeah, I know the film. And <laughs> And he said, I think it's the most important war movie that's ever been made. I was, and he blew me away. I mean, he just, I was really, um, yeah, uh, I was very, very surprised. And, and uh, yeah, I felt privileged. And then at the same time, there were the others, you know, the German, uh, the chief of army protocol is like, you know, still trying to get back at the British. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this this uh, was really surprising, um, but um, yeah. And then once we once we shot the film, I think it really started to take on a life of its own. And once we started to log it and to see what was there, um, but I do think it's actually a quite difficult film in a way. Um, at the moment, the trend in documentary is to have uh, like a single character uh, dramatic story. Um, or to have a kind of essay, which is like you have an argument and then you have a lot of people who logically make this argument. Um, and these are su very successful films. And this, this film is none of those things. And I think it's uh, harder for people. But, um, but I, I was also interested after having made The Act of Killing and uh, spent so many years going back and forth to Indonesia. Um, I wanted also to make something that was reflective more of the place that I'm actually coming from. You know, I'm an American, well, I, my parents are Korean, but I, you know, I, I was born and raised in the United States. I've been living in Europe for about 18 years. And, um, and the question of the connection that we have with the conflicts that are happening in other places in the world, I think I wanted to talk about that. And I wanted to talk about the way in which, I mean, if there's something in the act of killing that it's talking about like good guys and bad guys. And, and um, in my opinion, there are no good guys or bad guys. And in many ways, I think the thing that uh, interests or shocks people, at least in, in uh, Western Europe uh, uh, and in the United States about the act of killing is that, is to realize in some ways that they have much more um, they have much more in common with the perpetrators <laughs> than they have with the victims. And um, at the same time that we never explicitly talk about, for instance, US or UK complicity in what happened in Indonesia, which is actually there's a lot of evidence, but that's not what the film was about. But I wanted to start making something that was closer, uh, that, that actually connected me and the communities where I lived. Uh, to the kind of violence, uh, to to the to the things that were happening in the world, because it's, I think it's very easy to read it in the news and to say, oh yeah, that's really happening, that's terrible, you know, but it's actually uh, the way that we are. I think it's always been this way, but it, but it's increasingly so. Is that we are tangled up in everything, and and um, it's really not possible just to kind of wash your hands. And, and and sit back and change the channel, watch Netflix. I think this is, um, in a way, like I wanted to, to start to switch the lens back um, to the community where, where I feel like I'm living.
Некое друго прашање? И некој што сака да се вклучи во дискусијата со своје мислење? I would maybe like to jump in in here with something that I wanted to ask you before. It's, it's just a bit of a sleeve in the hand, um, just challenging. Um, after seeing the act of killing and seeing that last scene with An Anwar? Anwar. <coughs> Anwar. Uh, yeah. Is having already this physical reaction yeah. uh, after having lived through, re relived, reenacted what he has been doing in his youth and now seeing it on film. Um, and in a way, he, he starts seeing again, or he, he starts seeing at that very moment, what was uh, he doing actually, and what, what uh, did that all mean? Um, would you, do you think that it would work even for the act of killing to call it the act of seeing, and maybe even shooting ourselves to call it seeing ourselves? Can actually the, the cinema teach us how to see? The way how we see ourselves, again, like related to this idea of the camera as a mirror, but also to teach us how to see the other? I think that the reason why we watch cinema is because we're trying to learn how to see. And so it cannot by itself do that. You have to have the desire. You have to already be asking the question on some level um, in order for it, it to help you or for it to transform you. Um, but for those people who are actually um, uh, how can I say, where the ground is fertile already, mm -hmm. um, where they open themselves emotionally, for instance, uh, in a way that you might not be, obviously, if you're a perpetrator, you know, in court somewhere, you don't open yourself, you're in a defensive position. And cinema allows you to take a more intimate position, um, whether it's a, a fictional character, uh, or even when it's yourself, I think you can, um, it, it's the, the idea of the cinema is that you, um, that you are there in a way or that you start to both be with somebody who is on the screen, but also become this person that's on the screen. And I do believe that this, that you, you can use it in that way. But I think it can also be used in another way in which you can uh, take from the screen something and project it upon yourself and actually um, take from the screen something um, and start to act it out somehow in your, in your real life. And so I think that it's, it's both uh, a tool for transformation if you want it to be, but it can also it can also be uh, risky. It can be risky for you. How, how was it as a director in the act of killing? I had this continuous repetitive uh, question in my head. Uh, how, how did you feel the responsibility as a filmmaker, as a director in this, um, in this reenacting those real situations and putting these main characters who are actually real people who have gone through these things. And it doesn't matter that they have been the perpetrators in this um, uh, concrete situation, but that in the end, Anwar like, comes to this, uh, and like towards the end of the movie, to the situation where he physically already feels like probably the guilt or just the understanding of what was happening. Did you feel some kind of a responsibility towards this person or the main protagonist of the film and this process of transformation which any process of transformation as much as it gives uh, it, it can have a good result it can be a painful process or it can even break maybe the individual the the act of killing to me it it had this feeling of a sort of a psychodrama like there is in psychotherapy so reenacting what we have already lived and in that way kind of you know get getting to be more aware more conscious about our acts or our words or our deeds 
So uh, how was the the role of you as a as a director, like your responsibility? I think um one I should say that um it was Josh who had the personal relationship with Anwar. I had made a decision early on in this particular we had met a lot of different uh, people who had perp perpetrators who are killers and I had had different uh, relationships with them and by that time in our filming I had made a decision I I didn't want to be the main uh, contact person or so uh because it's a very difficult thing and um and also these particular this particular group of people uh who were in the former paramilitary people were also incredibly racist against Chinese. And I'm not Chinese, I'm Korean, but in this context, you, they don't really know the difference physically and also incredibly misogynist. And so, um, but in terms of responsibility, it's something that we thought about. I mean, we are not therapists. I'm married to a therapist, so I know the difference. And uh, what we were doing um, might have had certain traits of psychotherapy, but the, our intention was not actually to um, to heal him from his uh, trauma or so. And I, I think that um, it's there was a concern uh, that maybe that maybe, for instance, he could be suffering from PTSD from uh, post-traumatic stress or various other things, but um, these were risks that that we took and and feeling like um, at any moment we could stop uh, talking about, we, we, the filming could, might have to stop. And um, I think that um, there was a kind of tension on the set all the time, uh, understanding how how far could they go? Where's the red line? And yeah, well, no, because definitely there were parts where, you know, Anwar said, okay, that is it. That's, that's it. And, and we thought, okay, maybe that's completely it. Maybe there's going to be no more filming with this person um, and so on. And I think that this was, um, it was something that we talked about with the Indonesian crew a lot. And in many ways, I think that they really, um, at some point, they were just like, no, this is really important to do. And, and I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult. And I, and, and I have to say that I would never have done this with someone who was a survivor. I think we would have worked in a very different way. But because of the power that they enjoyed and the arrogance that they had, I think there was this sense in which, um, in a way, they had to be responsible for their own risks and that, um, of course, if something had happened on the set that was really too heavy, I think that we would have responded to that in some way. And so if Anwar wanted to stop filming, we would stop filming and that, and, and that would be that. Um, but um, it, it was a risky production, mm. I would say. Um, and Herzog was one of the executive producers, no? Yeah. On the film. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a risk involved, definitely. <laughs> he, he wouldn't be in a project unless there is something like that, I think. Um, feel free to jump in if you would like to. Um, otherwise, I would like to just ask finally Christine about her future projects and her future plans. I know that you're working on this new project, which is called uh, X2068. With some of you that have been on the masterclass, we have been talking a bit about it and we have made this interactive hackathon like Valentina and Christine have prepared for, for the participants of the masterclass. So what is it about? So X2068 is a project that I've been dreaming about since the end of the post-production of The Act of Killing and throughout the production of Shooting Ourselves. And it's really a way of taking the documentary production uh, methods that we used in which really it was like a laboratory. We would use, we would create a space in which people could imagine themselves. 
And this space was like something could happen in this uh, in this space. In the act of killing, it was like a fiction set. Um, in in um, shooting ourselves, it was uh, was like a simulated documentary set. And um, what we're trying to do is to actually create a laboratory on the future. I've worked very much on the past, um, and right now, how does the past? live in the present. I would say that the act of killing was very much about that. The next project is about how does the future live in the present? How do we use what we think or imagine about the future? And how does that, how do we see ourselves through the lens of the future and where we think we might be going? Uh, where our children, uh, what kind of world our children will be in or our grandchildren might be in. And so basically we take one character, a woman named X, She'll have a name, but she will be actually many different people. And um, she'll be born in 2045. And in a, so in 51 years, she'll be something like 23 years old in 2068. And so we are inviting people to uh, contribute to her story. And uh, in this instance, the first thing that we're going to talk about is climate change and pollution, and specifically in the Arctic, because that's where we live now, in the far north of Norway. And it's like taking um, this laboratory that we made in the documentary process and turning it inside out. So the audience is now also the subject, and they're also the, the co-creators with us. In many ways, Anwar kind of made that film with us, or there was some way in which we were working uh, together to improvise or, or it, it was an experiment. And now with, the, with um, using, uh, using the web and using apps in a different way, we're going to open this up, not just to one man and say his four or five friends, but we can actually open up to thousands of people. And uh, I, I, believe that, I believe something unexpected will happen, that once we start to get enough people involved and enough people who are, who are interacting, um, it's also a big change for me because I think that I will, um, it's not that I'm going to stop making feature films, but it's not necessarily going to be the main or the only thing that we make. And I actually feel that what's going to happen now is that it will be um, a more like a series, a serial project. So maybe more like a, a, fiction, um, a series of fiction shorts in which people think to themselves, ah, but do you know how that is made? And that if you're interested, you can actually log in and find a way to contribute or to participate in the making of the next episode of that series. And it's something in which, um, because I feel that if, um, I believe that the stories that we, uh, that we consume or that we absorb um, shape us in many ways. And that if we also start to become authors, if we also start to see ourselves as having the creative power to make stories and to use stories for our own purpose and to think about stories together, I actually believe that we can condition the future, that the way in which, that the stories that we think about the most, um, we, it's not that they destine, they, they predestine us to go in that direction, but they make that direction much more probable. And so the idea is to actually use stories um, to think about the direction that we would really like to go in, and perhaps some of the directions that we don't want to go in, or at least to debate the possibilities and to see if, you know, I call it story hacking because like it's really a process-based thing about how are stories made and what do stories do when we, uh, when we take them in? What does it mean to, to listen to or to see a story uh, take place and how does that change your life? And hacking is this process where, you know, you take a machine that's made for one purpose and then uh, you repurpose the machine. And I believe that story making and story reception can actually be repurposed. Uh, we can actually direct it in a different way. And so in many ways, this X2068 experiment is to see, it's almost like making a movement in a way, 
that uh, insofar as I'm an optimist, I believe that it's the human consciousness and our imagination that is, um, it's the key point at which uh, if we start to really imagine um, uh, a different way of being, uh, if we can't imagine it, I actually think that it's uh, almost impossible. But the more that we imagine it, or the more that we, we condition ourselves to, to think of ourselves as, um, as creators or as authors, uh, rather than a kind of passive audience, I, I believe that, that over time it can, it can really change what's actually possible. Um, and that, I don't know, I, I'm not saying that the, the film will, will uh, change everything. But I, I do believe that culture has, uh, has an extremely important role, way, way, way too important to be left to advertisers. And I think that, that people need to realize or, or to, to, to think about the stories that they make and to essentially see themselves as truly authors of the future. Um, whether this project can really do that or whether or not, I mean, this is, this is a question, but I'm actually hoping that the project is still running in 2045 when the character should be born and that there's this incredible uh, wealth of material that's been made by everybody saying, okay, this is what we think your life might be like. Um, and that this, uh, so in a way it's a kind of lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> project very different um, and and uh, exciting for us. Uh, Valentin is also part of this project, and there's a lot of different artists who are who are jo joining us at this moment. So hopefully you can look out for it. Um, we have a Facebook page, and we have um, we have a website now, and uh, we will start to produce a podcast in January uh, in English. Um, where you can actually uh, listen to, it's, it's factual, so we will be documenting behind the scenes how we start to gather material for the stories. Uh, we're working with a lot of scientists and artists and writers, and so you can hear discussions and things that we have with them and so on um, until the actual fiction series comes out. And so in many ways, like uh, the, there will probably also be a feature film in the end, but this idea that the uh, this is another debate is for people who are filmmakers or so on. But I, I think that the feature film format is actually, um, it's becoming a niche format and that there is um, many other ways in which people are, are watching things. And um, it's also interesting for me as a maker to, to explore uh, the different audiences that there are um, for say shorter pieces of fiction or for um, to say make a, a fiction uh, a fiction series and then have documentary material that is published alongside it rather than have one big film in which everything is put together which I also like but I think that it's um, in many ways I think more challenging for people and maybe a different effect Christine, we wish you uh, the best of luck with X2068. We hope that uh, we will see each other and that we will keep in touch and uh, see how the project is developing. Uh, I thank you also for coming to Macedonia and being our guest on the Philosophical Film Festival, allowing us to have the premiere of uh, the Macedonian premiere of shooting ourselves in here. And I invite the, the audience. We have a little informal cocktail uh, refreshment in the in the foyer, so just feel free. I guess okay. Christine is always inviting everyone for questions, <laughs> so I guess we can continue to talk informally outside. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, there is one question in there. This moment uh, comment because uh, you okay, know the yeah. courage department took a little time to kick in. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Caroline for uh, her quite uh, stunning production. You know, it started a bit uh, nice and slow, but uh, it took um, in quite um, quite a surprising dimension by the end of it. It, it was I was quite stunned. Um, there was. Um, uh, the theme of irony, I felt it was quite amazing, uh, even in the title of the film. 
uh, shooting ourselves. You know, this could mean um, you know, having a camera, making selfies of ourselves and such, and then shooting ourselves to death, which uh, means, again, the same thing. And this theme uh, was running throughout the whole film. Um, but what struck me most was this uh, Israeli uh, guy uh, who now works in a theater in Germany. I mean, uh, imagine that, you know, an Israeli Jew fleeing to Germany. I mean, how far has this world gone? I mean, uh, in a positive way, uh, which was, to me, it was, you know, surprising and uh, a bit unimaginable. But uh, it's a good sign that this world uh, can change. It can change in a positive direction, but uh, uh, we are at the very moment becoming aware of who we are as humans. Uh, you know, the, our consciousness is uh, still developing, but we are at this uh, point in time where uh, we're becoming aware of what war is, on how it's affecting all of us, and uh, how there's this uh, mythological, this irrational dimension toward that goes beyond the economical element, which is still a great danger because uh, most of humanity is not aware of this. It's not just the economy of war. I mean, That's true. Uh, it's uh, something much more deeper. I mean, we've uh, evolved in war, and that's uh, this why these people, you know, they find themselves. You know, I've been producing these guns, but no, I'm not using them, so it's uh, I'm morally clean. But this is pretty much what uh, had always been throughout history. And we've grown uh, almost, you know, it's uh, not irrational, but it's subconscious. The subconsciousness to this war, which uh, makes it normal. This is how we survive. And uh, we're at this point, you know, at this point in our consciousness that we understand because we how we are affecting the rest of us, how we affect uh, the world around us, how uh, these guns are actually, you know, killing people somewhere and that in the end is killing ourselves. And, um, you know, it took me a while you know, to think about this, this way I couldn't comment before. And um, I think that's amazing. I mean, you've done a quite quite a film here, you know, and all the potential, you know, Thank you. that humanity actually has. It's, it's good that you mentioned irony. I've been thinking about it lately because I've been thinking a lot about American culture and irony. And I feel that my generation, having grown up as a kid in the 80s, that irony is like a part of our blood or something. It's, you know, at the same time that irony is essentially a defense. Um, and it, it can easily lead to cynicism. Um, because of a, a kind of, it's it's a survival. It's a survival. Just like black mechanism. humor. Yes, and I I, I it's, think it's horrible, but yes, uh, you know this keeps us sane, uh, which is still yes. very strange. I think it, and I think it's very important, and I, I, I could never cut it out of myself. At the same time, that I think that um, while I see the irony in the situations, and I think that it's it's helpful. I think I don't feel ironic about the bigger situation. And I, I think that it's, um, at the same time, it, it is important to see the absurd. Yes, but there, there's in, also hope. Inside of you know, it. Mm. It ends in hope because uh, here are all these people who probably, you know, spent quite a lot of their lives fighting each other, not if not directly, but indirectly. I mean, I saw that Pakistani guy, and this Indian guy, I mean, they, they have a quite a turbulent history. I mean, Pakistan was part of India. <laughs> they're quite, um, there's animosity between their countries. You know, oh, they're sitting here, there's hope, you know, there's hope for humanity. If yes. I, you can see this happening. <laughs> yes. And I, I think, I mean, the thing about Germany and Israel is, is I was going to say... It's mind-blowing. It, it, it gets even worse than that because he, he actually then went, to, uh, he went back to live in Israel but to work for the Goethe Institute, which is the German cultural yes, yes. <laughs> institute. I mean, and, uh, <laughs> and like if he had gone and actually made the Battle of Algiers in Israel for the Goethe Institute, it would have been like, uh, it's just a completely crazy 
thing. And I mean, I think if you look at, for instance, it's, it's Angela, an inception of irony. <laughs> Angela Merkel is the head of the CDU, it's the, the Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's the Conservative Party. But if you see the way in in which you know the the stand that they've taken on the on on immigration in Europe, I think. I, I think there's something special the, about the, the way the, that Germany has actually processed its own history. Yes, but this black and white world is dissolving, and the, the, I think mm. that's uh, where at this moment is history when we actually are, because authoritarianism is pretty much everywhere questioned, except maybe North Korea, but well, it's also propaganda what we mostly hear, I believe, I'm not sure really. You can't completely trust any media. They all have some kind of an, an, uh, an agenda, you know, whether it's private, whether it's a conglomerate of interests, and it's, this is problematic. But maybe we, sh we can yeah, take we this can into the talk. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Bye. Um, I think that we're humans existed, um, that mechanism of fighting or killing someone is a part of us. It's deep planted in us. In the beginning of the movie, there was a man that said something like that, that the most innocent people turned to more monsters. monsters. Exactly. It's not like we want to. That's just our nature. It's our nature, because in a way, we are like animals. Because if I think we I think that we want to like, we want to um, prove ourselves that we are better by describing ourselves as humans. Why? Because we are smart and all like. But we are all living creatures. So, um, well, I wanted actually to ask about something else. I just wanted to make a point. Um, it's it's really emotional. It's really emotional, especially. Um, having to talk about that, confront, confronting ourselves with something that we look away from, something that makes us feel bad. So when something makes us feel bad, we just turn our heads around. And during the looking at it, it makes us feel different. So I just wanted to ask, how do you prepare? How do you emotionally prepare before starting to shoot something like that? That's a really good question. I think that um, after years of uh, filming in Indonesia and uh, dealing with people who were both survivors and perpetrators of a genocide, um, there is a certain kind of, uh, I have to be open to people and at the same time, um, I also have to have a defense. And I, it's, it's important for me to, I will have a moment in the editing room and when I'm by myself after shooting where I can start to sort through uh, my own responses to things. But I do actually feel um, that when you're, when you're filming, it's like work and, and that you need to be present. Uh, you need to be present, but you also need to defend yourself in a way. Um, and it's, um, it's a difficult thing that I think you can only learn by doing it. Um, and even when you talk to people about very difficult things, and even when you talk to people who are total, um, people who have done terrible things, or people who have not done terrible things but are just assholes, um, you kind of also have to respect in some way um, you you have to switch off that part of yourself that is very judgmental and, and will, um, will not uh, accept a person or doesn't want to be with someone and actually start to ask it in a different way and say, well, what makes this person like that? Is there another aspect to this person? Can, can you speak to them in a way that will, will you start to see some shift or change? And it's a kind of challenge when you speak with someone and when you uh, engage with someone with a camera. And I, I think that it's, um, but it is very, it's a very practical thing and it's something that uh, each filmmaker will do in their own way. And so it's the thing, the thing you have to do is just, you have to keep practicing. You have to be filming all the time, even if you're not necessarily making a film. 
um, I think it's really important to continue to film and to because you train your eye, uh, you train your mind, and you train your way of uh, of dealing with people. Um, and what's really different now for me, I was just talking to Valentin about this, is that with this new project now, is that when I'm filming with someone, I'm always uh, it's like being a guest and a host at the same time. And you, you're, you're very intensively aware of the other person. And, um, but I never used to really think about the audience of the work in that way. And now I'm actually starting to uh, take the attitude that I used to keep for the subject, for the people that I was filming, um, and now turning it more towards the audience. Because now the audience and the subject are going to actually be in the same cycle. And so that's a really, it's a really big change for me um, because in a way, like, I was one of those artists I said, you know, I'm the primary audience member. <laughs> it's my own satisfaction that I was really looking for. And I think that it's not that I don't want my own satisfaction anymore, but I, I feel that, um, that um, I want to, um, the challenge for me now is actually to include the audience in a new way. And, and, and you know, we talk about reflexive loops, but I think that the audience should be part of this reflexive loop. It's not just the subject watching themselves, but it, to also now include uh, the viewers in the loop. Uh, um, this, is, this is the next phase for me. Okay, okay. so I think we're going <laughs> to... <Yeah. laughs> but we can speak later. Yep. Thank you.